So you may have learned earlier that the truth with regards to uh, gravity, uh, but uh, GE, is that uh, the gravitational fields actually radiate into the Earth, like so. Okay, but when you're really close to the surface of the Earth, it looks more or less as if they are parallel. All right, and that's why you have this uniform intensity of 9.81 uh, meters per second squared, or uh, newtons per kilogram. Okay. Um, now, with regards to electric fields, it is possible for them to be parallel as well. I know that where you're thinking, what if I just stay really, really close to an electron, which is going to be very difficult because electrons are really small. All right. But there is a way to make uniform E fields, even at a scale size of this physically that I'm showing you here. All right. There's a really cool hack for that. And all you need to do for that is to get two plates and place them side by side, parallel like so. Because if you still happen to do that, in between the two, you will end up having parallel E fields. Of course, there's a little catch uh, at the edges because you don't have any more positive charges on plates, uh, it will end up having a weird looking bulge around it. Don't believe me? Yeah, let's simulate it. Why not? I just hope that this program will work. Here you go. Okay, let's simulate this away. Okay, so positive charge. Hey, grid actually helps so that we can line it all up. Okay, and there's a positive charge there. Place another one right over here. I'm just gonna place just a few just to get the idea across. All right, so yeah, if you had one just straight parallel plate that looks like this, yes, near the surface, it'll appear to be parallel, but you'll see that it'll start to diverge at the edges, or sorry, from far away from it. Okay, so from far away, it's gonna start diverging. If you want it to be genuinely parallel, then you will probably wanna strengthen everything by placing negative charges, uh, equal distance, but further away uh, from the corresponding positive charge. And if you end up doing this, you'll notice that directly between the two plates, you're going to end up generating E fields that are perfectly parallel to each other. So that is our tiny little life hack on how you can generate uniform E fields. And you'll notice that in the simulation, it actually points out to you as well that uh, unfortunately, you're going to have this weird looking bulge at the edges, just like Holly mentioned over here. Okay, so this hack in general does work really well uh, as long as you have the plates longer than the separation between the two. Okay, because if, if the plates are really tiny, you're not going to have uh, as good of effect. And that's why you'll notice that I had to place a lot of positive charges uh, just to create this, this good looking effect. If I had too few, it's not going to look as good. Okay, so the distance of separation should be shorter than the length of the plates themselves. And then in between, you can have a fair approximation of uniform E fields. So it is possible. It is technically possible. And yeah, it is technically possible as well to show this in real life, where I have this lovely picture over here of how someone was able to simulate it. What they did was that they created a potential difference of thousands of volts. I'm sure it's, I don't know, it could be, I don't know what 10,000 volts, but at least a thousand volts uh, between these two. And then you can sprinkle an indicator on top. Like for example, magnetism, you use iron filings to look at the magnetic fields. In this case over here, uh, anything that which is uh, an insulator, but can become ionized like grass seeds. If you sprinkle them between, then the little seeds will just ionize and have a delta positive and a delta negative on each, on each seedling and end up lining up in such a way that you'll notice that they are roughly parallel in the center. All right, so that's a good way of tracing it just to see that they are parallel. All right, and why do we care about this? Well, it's to make life a whole lot easier because the problem about having just a charge that's positive right over here, okay, you know that it's really strong at the beginning, the charge, and it diminishes as you move further and further away. So if you place a negative charge over here, uh, well, actually, I'll just use another positive charge over here, okay? The force of repulsion will be really great here. Meanwhile, if you place the positive charge over here, the repulsion will be rather tiny, all right? So you can't create any situation, at least in the setup over here, of uniform acceleration. That's not going to happen here. Okay, It won't be uniform acceleration. It'll be a, a jerk curve. All right, so if you wanted to experience, is it jerk? I don't even know. It just will not be uniform acceleration. Okay, but if you want to experience uniform acceleration, why not just place this test charge inside a uniform E field? Then no matter where I place the charge in this E field, the rate of acceleration will be the same. Okay, it'll experience the same exact value of Fe because 
uh, Fe is equal to Q times a uniform E field. And that's how we create a uniform E field, right? By having two parallel plates. Now we can use the hack of using this formula here. Okay. Uh, and here, another benefit is if you know the force, it will be uniform from here to all the way over here. It will be the same force. Then you can go off and use this formula as well. Work is equal to Fe because it's a uniform force times the distance that it traveled from point A to point B. Okay, so there are many benefits of using a uniform electric field. Um, it just simplifies our calculations quite a bit. Okay, so from last class, we covered this formula over here. And if you were to convert this into the definition of volts, then, you know, work over charge is our work. Yeah, as I'm sorry, is our voltage. All right, so by definition, voltage is equal to electric field uh, times the distance it travels. That's our potential difference. Um, other things to keep in mind is that the voltage will uniformly change through the field. Do I have a picture of this over here? Yeah, because this is a uniform uh, plate over here, uh, the, the voltage from here to here, whatever the value is, well, since this formula over here is a linear correlation, then if I move it to a point over here where it's delta D over 2, expect the voltage to be half. And if I place it over here where it's delta D a quarter of the way, then expect the voltage to be a quarter. And that's what the whole idea about a uh, uniform gradient is. Right? If you've ever done gradient in color art, it's a gradual transition between one color to the next color. Right? There's no sharp uh, change in the gradient from, let's say, from, I don't know, red to uh, yellow. Right? It just gradually changes from red to orangey red to orange to uh, orangey yellowish to yellowish orange to off to yellow. If you know what I'm talking about in colors, it just uniformly transitions from there. And that's what we're trying to point out over here as well. So let's say that this plate voltage was, let's say it's 100 volts, okay? So it's 100 volts on top over here and zero volts over here. If we're at the exact midpoint, we'd expect it to be at 50 volts. If we're at the quarter point, we expect it to be 25 volts. If we're at three quarters of the way there, we expect it to be at 75 volts. All right, so it's going to uniformly change as we uh, move from one plate to the next. Uh, so this calculation over here is just to, just to calculate out what the E field intensity is. So let's say we have these two parallel plates over here. The potential difference between the two is five volts and they're separated by 10 centimeters. One thing to watch out for, MKS, all right? Meters, kilograms, seconds. So make sure this is converted to 0 0.1 meters when you do your calculation. All right, so if you need to know what the electric field is over here, that's equal to, uh, potential difference divided by uh, distance. All right. So our 5.0 volts divided by 0 0.1 meter will give us the corresponding 50 newtons per coulomb. Okay, so let's go through this example over here. Two parallel plates are separated by 0 0.05 meters. Electric potential over here is 80 volts. 80 volts on top, whoops. 80 volts down below and 0 volts on top. Could you arguably say 0 volts and negative 80? Uh, that would just make it confusing. I wouldn't I wouldn't dare try something like that. I mean, yeah, I guess it would technically be 0 and negative 80 here. All right, but I'd, I'd rather not play that weird game. Let's just assume that negative is at the 0 potential and the positive is at 80 volts. So remember, this is potential difference, all right? So there is no absolute zero volts in this universe. All voltages are all relative to another point in space. That's why it's a potential difference. Okay, so compared to this, if we assume that it's at zero volts at the negative plate, then the drop at the other end will be 80 volts. Okay, well, and what are we looking for here? What is electric field intensity between the two? Well, that's not too bad. Electric field intensity is equal to potential difference. Uh, over a distance of separation. So that's uh, 80 volts divided by 0 0.05 meters. Where if we pull out our calculator, here's our calculator. Then 80 divided by 0 0.05 will give us 1600. Did I do that properly? Yeah. 
there you go, 16, wait, what did I get? Yeah, 1.6 times, yeah, 1600. 1.6 times 10 to the 3 uh, newtons per coulomb. What is the potential difference between point A and point B? Well, if this is a total of 5 centimeters over here, then over here, this is 4 fifths along the way. So 4 fifths of 80 volts is equal to uh, uh, 6.4. Right, 80% of 80 volts, 6.4 volts. And if we look at point B, then this is 2 fifths of the way to five-fifths of the way all the way down here, right, uh, by distance-wise. So two-fifths is equal to 40%, and 40% of 80 is 3.2 volts. So if you really want to look at the voltage between A and B, that's equal to the voltage at point A, subtract the voltage at point B, so that's equal to 6.4 volts minus 3.2 volts, which will give you 3.2 volts. Uh, 32 volts because I didn't need a decimal place there. Whoopsie daisy. There you go. I apologize. It's 80, not 8. 80 times 80% uh, and 80 times 40%. Uh, what force would be experienced by a small 2 microcoulomb charge placed at point A? In fact, it doesn't even matter where you place it. It doesn't have to be point A. It could be anywhere, right? Because again, this is a uniform electric field. In this case over here, the field's pointing upwards because fields move from the positive and travel to the negative. All right, so it doesn't matter where we place it, it's only going to be the same force. And force is equal to Q times E field. So a charge of 2 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs multiplied by an E field of 1600 newtons per coulomb. Here's where you got to think about what's going to happen. All right, we have a positive charge here. And yeah, let's say we place it at point A just because we decided to. Well, we know that the positive charge will not like the positive plate. It's going to move towards the negative plate. So this force at the end of the day, force is a vector. In fact, the proper formula looks like this, okay? Because a scalar times a vector will always give us a vector. Don't believe me? Well, distance is equal to uh, velocity times time, right? If your velocity is towards the east, your displacement has no choice but to go towards the east, okay? So vector times scalar will always give you the vector, and the vector will be in the same direction, okay? All right, so in this case over here, our 2 uh, times 10 to the negative 6 times 1600 will give us uh, 3.2 times 10 to the negative 3 newtons. There you go. My mental math is still there. Uh, D, if an electron was placed at the negative plate, so you decided to put an E negative, that's our short form for electron, uh, from, from rest, what will its velocity be uh, by the time it goes and smacks against the positive plate? Huh. Good question. Let's go through that. And there are many different ways of solving that question there. Okay, there, there are many different approaches. Uh, I'm going to do the approach of, uh, well, work, I guess. Okay, work we know is equal to force, and this is electric force times the distance that it travels. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what the force is, and F is equal to QE. In fact, I suppose we covered the formula already. Uh, work is equal to QE delta D. All right, uh, why do we want to know this? Because we also know that work by definition is equal to the change in energy, the change in kinetic energy. All right, so let's go and calculate the work and then we can convert that into uh, how fast it's traveling. Okay, so work is equal to the charge of an electron, which is 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. And if you're wondering, you know, should I be using a plus or minus sign? You have to think about this logically, what's happening you know that the electron starts uh, from the negative plate, it's gonna hate it, so it's gonna move towards the positive. All right, it's gonna perform positive work as it accelerates away from the negative plate. All right, so your work is gonna be positive at the end of the day. All right, so 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs times the electric field of 1.602 times 10 to the three newtons per coulomb times the distance of 0 0.05 meters is equal to remember to use this minus sign that's negative as opposed to subtract all right otherwise your calculator will go nuts on you uh, times the electric field of whoops oh yeah no that's correct 1.6 to the power of 3 I just had a, a the 602 by accident and we're going to multiply by 0 0.05 
So the work is going to be a positive quantity of work, but a very small number. 1.281617 joules. Good. All right. So that's our work there. Uh, doesn't seem like much, but don't forget, it's really tiny. All right. And we also know that work is equal to delta EK. So our work is equal to 1 half mvf squared minus 1 half mvi squared. Remember that the electron was placed at rest at the negative plate or very close to it. So it doesn't get absorbed by the plate. All right. So our initial velocity was at zero. OK. So if we want to find out our VF, our VF is equal to the root of two work over mass. Yep, all square rooted. So VF is equal to the root of two times 1.2816 times 10 to the negative 17 joules divided by the mass of, uh, what is an electron? Oh yeah, 911. Oh, you use 91. It's 911 times 10 to the negative 31 if you want to show three sig fig. All right, so the square root, and this one open brackets for me automatically, two times uh, the answer that I had divided by 9.1 times 10 to the negative 31. And you know, does the one the extra one really matter? Uh, if you take a look at the percentage error between uh, 9.10 versus 9.11, it's probably not going to change your answer much, at least to three sig fig. On top of that, you're square rooting, all right? So your errors actually decrease when you square root. Okay, so it travels crazy fast. 5.3 times 10 to the, was that six? Yeah, 5.30 times 10 to the six meters per second. Crazy fast. Okay, and oh, I almost forgot, velocity. Oh, almost got the answer wrong, down because VF is a vector. Final velocity, not our final speed. Okay, we'll be pointing downwards. All right, so uh, here's uh, just one example of applying what we've learned from before in solving these problems here. Um, just so that we can allude towards Millikan's experiment, let me just go through a bit of chemistry history. All right, it wasn't until about 200 years ago where we finally even looked into what makes matter again. All right, I know it was discovered uh, many thousands of years ago, or not discovered, thought of many thousands of years ago, but it really wasn't paid attention to until about 200 years ago that, hey, everything is uh, made up of atoms. And it took a couple of uh, decades before we found all the different types of elements out there and arranged them in a periodic table, all right, by good old Dmitry Mendeleev, all right? He's the inventor of the periodic table. Uh, a couple of years after that, there was an experiment uh, that by J.D. Thompson. If you remember, J.D. Thompson was a guy who discovered that, you know what, inside any every given atom, there are positive and negative charges. And he thought it looked kind of like a yummy, delicious cookie or plum pudding, however you want to decide of it. Okay, and that's the constituents of what makes every dif different uh, atom out there, right? There, there's something positive in there and there's probably something negative there. All right, so he discovered that there are electrons. Um, now he didn't know where the electrons existed. He just knew that they could be ejected out there. Okay, so maybe the electrons are on the outside, who knows, but the electrons did exist. And you'll notice that I, that I have no letter N here, okay? Neutrons weren't discovered yet. It didn't. It was. It wasn't for another. I think sixty years before they discovered that that uh, neutrons were in the nucleus. Okay. Now at J.J. Thompson's point, he was able to discern that the electron or the thing was it was that it was ejected at had this much um, charge per kilogram. Okay. The charge to the mass ratio. He discovered this ratio by using this contraption that you'll see in my next slide. Okay. But he didn't know how much the mass of an electron was. Because if you could find out the mass of an electron, then you can figure out what charge each electron had. Um, and it was Robert Milken who had this other interesting experiment that because you can't really measure the mass of an electron, you kind of had to reverse calculate it out. He discovered what the charge of the electron was. And from that, then you can figure out what the mass of an electron is. Okay, and that's what I want to talk about in a bit more detail right now. The story of Robert Milliken. 
But just so you can see the big picture of everything that's going on, let's talk about all the other scientists as well that we talked about back in grade 9 chemistry. Uh, Ernest Rutherford was the first person to discover that there is a nucleus. So in other words, the, there's a center, and the center was probably made of protons and maybe something else. And then the electrons were circling around it. And you may have seen this very famous picture, which is a terrible representation of what uh, uh, an atom looks like but we understood that electrons hovered somewhere outside. Okay, and uh, yeah, the Bohr-Rutherford diagram is emphasizing that there are different shells and each shell has a different energy level, which you briefly covered in grade 11, no, in grade nine and 10. Uh, and in grade 11, hopefully you learned about all the different shells, no, grade 12, take grade 12 chemistry, right? And you'll see that orbital shells aren't just perfect circles anymore. They start looking like bow ties and all, the, and all these other shapes. Right, it gets really complicated. And yeah, it wasn't until 1932 that it was discovered that the nucleus not only contains protons, but they can get heavier because of these other uh, subatomic particles called neutrons. Right, And that's our general picture, but today we're just going to focus on uh, Robert Millikan's uh, contribution towards chemistry in a physics class. All right, so let's just talk about his experiment and the story behind it. And I'm not going to play the video here because uh, I don't want to make this this video too long, so I'm just going to attach it as a, a following uh, playlist. All right, so if you're not on the playlist yet, make sure you find out where this video comes from. Go to the playlist, and that playlist will let you watch the next video, which will be on the Millikan's famous experiment and how you can uh, recreate this experiment in your own classroom. Okay, uh, but in general, he created this ugly looking contraption where I have a picture inside over here. This is what it looks like, where he was able to allow small little droplets to pass into two parallel plates. All right, so you have a plate up here, let's say it's positive, and a plate down here that's negative. Now, could you make the bottom positive and the top negative? Sure you can. You just have to hook up the machine so that you have this uh, dial. They're able to dial into either high positive values or uh, high negative values. All right, and you have your leads connected to it. All right, so these two parallel plates where you can variably adjust the voltages to high positive voltages or very high negative potential difference voltages. Why did you do such a crazy thing? Because as these droplets, uh, first off, as they were ejected out of his sprayer, uh, the, the little droplets were rubbing against the apparatus itself, causing electrons to be stripped of it, let's say, or bounced off ricocheted so they could actually be stuck on other uh, particles, making it positively charged. Right. So these are all ionized little particles and they would fall through. And as they fa fell through, the moment you turn on these plates, let's say that this was positively charged. In this case, if you turn it on, it's just going to rapidly drop down and smack into the plate. So if you notice that he quickly stopped the plates and he'd flip them around and that will cause it to slowly well, to decelerate, come to rest and then start moving upwards again. Now these are very tiny particles, and because they're down tiny particles, they behave kind of like how you drop a balloon, right? If you drop a balloon, it doesn't travel or accelerate at 9.8 meters per second squared. Instead, it accelerates and it reaches something known as its terminal velocity. All right, so with tiny little droplets, they will naturally reach their terminal velocity as well. So by observing its terminal velocity with the field plates off and observing its new velocity with the plates on, he was able to do a little bit of reverse calculation to figure out uh, what force was involved in causing it to move to its new velocity. And by figuring out the force involved, he could slowly calculate out what charge there was in each of these droplets. And when he was doing the experiment, he noticed that these values were quantized. In other words, they were either this value, or this value, or this value, but no value in between. It's like quantizing in music, if you're familiar with music. Okay, If you quantize into quarters, then your notes are on every quarter. There's no eighth in there. Okay, So that's what quantization is, putting things into fixed little bucket values. Now, we would hope that the values would be nice and clean, like 1, 2, 3, 4. But in Millikan's discovery, he noticed that the numbers are not clean numbers. They are these very ugly numbers. Okay. Uh, but let's get, just go through the brief math of what he was doing. Okay, so this is the force of the charge acting on the charge versus the force of gravity. Uh, if they were traveling at the same consistent rates, what did he do? I can't remember. He turned on the field plate. The field plate created something to travel at a consistent velocity. And by doing some reverse calculations, he was able to collect data, and it looks something like this. All right. So there were a lot of them that behaved like this value here. Some behaved like this, some behaved like that, and others behaved like that. Numbers look kind of familiar. All right. 
Today, we know that the charge of one electron is this value over here. So where does the rest of the data come from? Well, sometimes in that little droplet, it doesn't have just one electron added to it. Okay, let's say it had two electrons added to it. You'll get that value. Sometimes it may have three electrons added to it. You're going to get that value. All right, so from doing his crazy experiment over the course of, I think, nearly a decade, because he just went to his basement every night and worked on it for hours on end, uh, he noticed that the data would look something like this. All right, they're quantized into these packets over here, which at the end of the day, it's nothing more than just based upon how many electrons existed in each little droplet. Now, his original experiment, he used water as his droplets, but as you may know, water evaporates very easily. All right, and then the droplets get smaller and smaller and smaller, and his answers were all thrown off. So later on, he realized that, you know, I shouldn't be using uh, water droplets, I should be using oil drops. And that's why this experiment is now famously known as Millikan's oil drop experiment. All right, because he used these tiny little oil droplets and it was able to slowly reverse calculate and figure out the charge of an electron. That's the video, which you can watch if you decide to move on to the next section. All right. Um, if you're wondering what it looks like inside his experiment, uh, we have a more modern class model of it and it looks like this. So this is the view through it. And you know, I'll attach a video after it so you can watch the whole thing on that and that uh, part of the playlist. Okay. And and if you're in the classroom with me, we do have one of those apparatuses around or apparatus. And uh, instead of using water, instead of using oil, we're going to use tiny little uh, synthetic balls. Because with tiny small synthetic balls, we know the density of the ball, we know all these other properties of the ball, like the diameter and whatnot, and it just makes life a whole lot easier compared to what Millikan had to deal with. All right, because first he had to figure out the size of the oil droplet and slowly figure out its, its, uh, its terminal velocity, which will then figure out the the mass of each droplet and so on and so forth. It's torture. It's going to be given to you. Okay, most of the values are going to be given to you. Is it listed here? Yeah, most of it will be given to you. So you already know um, the distance of separation of the plates. That's what this value here is. The radius of the droplet and other constants you'll know as well. Okay, it's all given to us. It makes our life a whole lot easier. And the whole purpose of the experiment is to find out that terminal velocity, all right? of it with the plates turned on okay and by doing that you can slowly reverse calculate out uh, the, the corresponding charges okay and yeah in the classroom I'll just have each of the students go through two droplets just observing them at their terminal velocity and uh, I'll be splitting the class into roughly around 12 groups so 12 groups times two charges each will give you a total of 24 data points to collect and with those 24 data points you could figure out uh, the, the trends that exist and you'll with those trends you can slowly reverse calculate and figure out the charge of an electron all right and that's the wonderful experiment anyways uh, there you go there's the homework for tonight make sure you go through all the homework over the next few days we'll go through the lab and I'll catch you in the next episode see ya